It wasn't enough just to uncover missing women. We still needed to know why women had been so persistently disadvantaged, oppressed, marginalized, subordinated. You pick the word. By what mechanism had they been kept in their places, convinced that their natural roles were limited and that they could not or should not imagine exceeding them? It was when those questions came to the forefront that we concluded that examining women was not enough. We had to understand the gender system that shaped their lives and their thoughts. We imagine gender, like race or class, as the social relation of the sexes. Just as we can understand more about African Americans if we understand race as a system of meaning, just as we can understand more about workers if we understand how class relations function, so we might understand more about women if we understand that men and women together and in relationship with each other share a gender system. Like class and race, gender is normative. A gender system shapes our expectations of ourselves. It models or restrains our aspirations. It provides the boundaries of our imaginations, illustrations, of what we may or may not accomplish. It defines what's fair and what is not fair. Gender doesn't do any of these things alone, of course. It operates in conjunction with class and race and religion and a host of other meaning systems, to use a phrase that the sociologist Frank Parkin developed, to determine the conditions under which men and women live. Because we believe it to be natural, gender is in some sense self-policing. Just as colonists believed there was a God-given order and later a natural order that kept each man in his own position, so the relative positions of men and women had been ordained, or so it was thought. They were not subject to protest. It was just the way things were. Under those circumstances, it was understandable that most women accepted their disadvantaged positions. But how then did we account for rebellion, for the adventurous individual or the rise of a women's rights movement in the 19th century? We would need to know something not only of how the gender system itself came to be, but how it shaped consciousness, how it exercised continuing constraint, not only over women, but over men too. Answering these questions was complicated, turning us into interdisciplinary scholars who sought the advice and consulted with anthropologists, sociologists, economists, and others. Only in collaboration with each other could historians together answer the most significant and hardest questions? Gerda Lerner contributed two influential books to the discussion. The Creation of Patriarchy argued that women were the first slaves, and indeed, that the idea of slavery was modeled on the treatment of women who had to be constrained and restrained to make sure that the children they bore were those of the men who wanted to claim fatherhood. She followed this book with the creation of feminist consciousness, in which she asserted that it was males who had predominantly created what she called the symbol systems, the significance that was vested in the male athletic body, for example, the symbol systems that had generated and perpetuated particular kinds of consciousness. As we began to understand how gender worked, how it was sustained over time, how it operated in interaction with class and race, we began to understand it as a system of ideas as well as practices that exercised power. Gender was not a static thing. It was a process changing over time and with historical circumstance. Gender provided an analytic framework, a way of understanding how the world worked, 
how ideas about sexual relations could change human relationships and possibilities, how ideas about who was civilized and who was not could change the world. We knew then that we had history by the throat, that a history that ignored gender could only be limited, partial, so flawed that we could not credit its assumptions and conclusions. You ask, why do we need to study women's history? And I answer that all historians now have to take into account new kinds of sources, interdisciplinary methods, collaborative techniques, insights that come both from disciplinary practice and from outside the box. All historians now need to fully understand the power relationships that are themselves at least partially governed by gender.